Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm going to try this with my glasses on first. I am completely paperless today. Um, <clears throat> and I have, um, have some visual difficulties with and without my glasses when I'm trying to read from my computer. So I want to welcome you all to the second session of the day on the theme of accessing museum collections as an Indigenous person. Uh, can you hear me okay? I bit my tongue last night and it's swollen, so. <laughs> Yeah, there could fine. be you're some fine. perfect. Thank you. If I drool on you, please accept my apologies in advance. So I'm gonna take my glasses off. My name is Del Jacko. I am a legit recognized member of the Kitagon Zibi Anishinaabeg in Quebec, born and raised, family relations alive and well, and connected to a lot of different families, including, of course the paternal Jackos, maternal Mores and Wagush, including a history with um, oh, the, um, my paternal grandfather was adopted into the Morin Wagush family and he is originally by blood, <clears throat> sorry, a, um, a Windigo. On my paternal side, my relations, of course, include the Smiths, the Jackos, mayors. So, yes, leg legitimately connected. There will be three presentations in this session. The value of making Indigenous collections accessible by Melissa Phillips. Accessing Museum Overseas by Laura Piers. And I have to remember with my hands, Recovering Weaving Knowledge Through Ancestral Arts in Museum Collections by Mick Miguans and Renee Diller. I will start by introducing our first speaker, Melissa Phillips. Melissa Phillips is currently the Museum Collections Assistant at Museum Windsor, a role she has been in since 2012. She's a member of Oneida Nation of the Thames Turtle Clan. Melissa holds a Bachelor of Arts degree and a Master's degree in, the, in history from the University of Windsor. She is also a graduate of the RBC Aboriginal Training Program in Museum Practices, an eight month internship at the Canadian Museum of History in Gatineau, Quebec. Melissa, would you please unmute and start your presentation? Skoli, Buju, Ani, thank you, Del, for the introduction. And I am honored to be speaking to all of you today. As Del mentioned, I'm Melissa Phillips, Collections Assistant at Museum Windsor and Haudenosaunee member of Oneida Nation of the Thames Turtle Clan. We are a municipally run museum, and as most of you know, working in a smaller institution, uh, wear many hats, and Collections Assistant is just my main role. Um, museum Windsor is located in Windsor, Ontario, in southwestern Ontario, just across the river from Detroit, Michigan. Recognized as one of Canada's most diverse and multicultural communities, our city was developed on land that is the tr traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people of the Three Fires Confederacy, consisting of the Ojibwe, Petawatomi, and Odawa. Before Europeans arrived, the land along the Detroit River was referred to as Wawayatanong by the indigenous populations, meaning where the river bends. Um, Due to Windsor's unique location along the Detroit River, many different groups have called this area home, including Haudenosaunee, Atawandaran, and Huron Wyandotte peoples. Today, many Indigenous people and Métis across Turtle Island call this area home. Um, I attended the first Indigenous Collections Symposium, uh, hosted by the OMA at Six Nations in Brantford, Ontario. And there were um, so many thought-provoking and inspiring sessions and discussions that I left that symposium excited and wondering what I could do, not just as an Indigenous person, but also what I could do as an Indigenous person working in the museum sector. My mind was just so scatterbrained with all kinds of ideas, um, one being very similar uh, to the Yukon's um, Searching for Our Heritage project and database. Uh, mostly I had this idea because Museum Windsor is one of the larger institutions in the Windsor-Essex area. And aside from archeological items such as arrowheads and other stone tools, 
we actually have very few indigenous items in our collection. Um, we have a handful, I would say probably under 10 uh, beaded works such as a gun bag, um, a pair of moccasins, um, a pair of gloves, pin cushion, a purse. Um, and with these, we have very little provenance or information in regards to the maker, culture, um, et cetera, in our catalog record. This is mostly because uh, these came into the collection in the 1960s at a time when there were not such great ethical practices with museum collections, such as trading. Um, our records indicate that most of the acquired, most of these were acquired from a private collector uh, who traded them for firearms in our collection. A funny story is that this same private collector called us up a few years back looking for the few former curator who he had done the trades with um, and he was looking to do some more trades. Our current curator informed him that our previous curator had passed away some years ago and that we no longer uh, do this practice of trading and collecting material for our collection. Um, so after attending the Indigenous Collections Symposium in 2017, it had me thinking, if we don't have many items, where could they be? Where have they gone? Um, so I had these great grandiose ideas that we could work with our local um, Indigenous communities, our Indigenous Advisory Committee, um, elders and other community members to search, trace, track down uh, local cultural items and other institutions from all over the place. And, um, you know, helping to assist if they wanted to pursue repatriation requests um, in any shape or form that was appealing to them. Um, I was very excited and pumped up to start this project. And then I had a roundtable discussion with my advisory committee and someone suggested about starting in our own backyard with the Walpole Island Heritage Center to assist cataloging their diverse collection. About the same time um, as these early discussions were taking place, the Ontario Museum Association was looking for partners and museums to assist in developing a diversity inclusion toolkit for museums as part of their inclusion 2025. Um, and Museum Windsor was a part of this where we did um, a case study. So if you attended um, the diversity and inclusion conference, I think it was in 2018, or it could be 2019. With the year of COVID, my years are sort of blended together. <laughs> um, so my apologies if this talk kind of overlaps with that. Um, I've tried to sort of change it up a little bit. Um, so for the scope of the inclusion project, Museum Windsor collaborated with Nindawabjig, meaning those who seek to find, to help catalog the center's book collection an oral history interview collection. Um, so Nindawajig is the Heritage Center and it is located within the Bikeshwanong Walpole Island First Nation. As part of this project, we implemented the Brian Deere system for their library collection. Brian Deere was a, is a Mohawk from Kanawage and he developed a library cataloging system for the for use in an indigenous context with the goal of reflecting indigenous viewpoints and values in knowledge organization. We also supplied the Heritage Center with digitization equipment so they could digitize their oral history cassettes of which they also had uh, transcripts of, but the transcripts are scattered um, all over the place. So we also helped um, locate those and organize those along with the cassettes. Um, this information was then added to, um, it's a shared database created in Microsoft Excel, and currently it's only an internal database available to Museum Windsor staff and Walpole Island Heritage Center staff, um, as we're still uh, working on it um, and adding things to it. Um, 
So the Heritage staff were very happy and pleased to partner and collaborate with us on this project because over the many years that they have existed, um, they've had numerous staff changeovers. And so one staff member might be there and familiarize themselves with the material and what they have. And then they would leave and the knowledge that they had about that would be gone. And then another staff member would come in um, they hold offices for um, other positions such as housing and social services of the Walpole Island First Nation there. So um, there's other staff members in there. Um, so it's easy to sort of lose track of information. Um, so they were pleased that they now have a list um, of stuff and they're aware of what they have and where it is and how to find it when they need it. So moving beyond the OMA collection, um, no, backtrack. Also as part of this, um, museum staff made many trips out to the Heritage Center um, to do this work, as well as uh, staff from the Heritage Center made a trip to uh, Museum Windsor and we did a tour so they could see um, our storage facilities and how we handle archival material um and items like that uh, so then moving beyond the oma inclusion project and back to the original idea of the collections of project that we had um, we were about to start assessing the heritage center's three-dimensional collection um, but then covid hit and now that is currently just on pause until things can get back to normal and we can uh, return to the heritage center to continue this process um, once we finish uh, with the Heritage Center's collection, we plan to work with them to find the appropriate database software um, for their collection. And it is the hope to make this internal database accessible online with the hopes of fostering greater access and information pertaining to Indigenous materials and culturally significant artifacts. I'm going to share a story with you, which I have, um, permission um, to share this story if uh, the person who originally tells it is unavailable to discuss it. Um, <clears throat> so while we were working on this project, a staff member that we were working with at the Heritage Center told us a story about a young man that they had there uh, as a co-op student who was transcribing um, some of the oral history interviews. And he described this person as he sort of just had this aura about, the, about him that, you know, he was just sad and down and kind of just had this dark aura about him while he was doing his co-op work there. And a number of years later, this co-op student um, saw the heritage worker in the community and he reached out to him and he was very thankful for the work he did there. He said at that time, he was very suicidal and having suicidal thoughts. And Transcribing those oral history interviews, he heard one of his ancestors talk about that traditional knowledge that he held. And this changed his life. It changed him. It made him feel connected to himself and made him feel whole again and helped him heal. So why is it important and valuable to make Indigenous collections accessible? Well, for one, you can establish a trusting relationship between Indigenous communities and museums, which has often been a tenuous relationship based on colonization and unethical practices of collecting. Secondly, there is a reciprocal relationship of understanding and exchange of knowledge. 
Museums can listen and learn about Indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing to help them assist in adapting uh, terminology um, for their catalog records and also uh, ways of displaying and storing um, certain cultural objects. Um, and Indigenous communities um, can also learn methods of accessioning and stuff like museum standards of that if they so choose. Um, and as from the story of the young man I mentioned, making them accessible provides the Indigenous community with a sense of connectedness, a connectedness to their community, a connectedness to their ancestors, and a connectedness within themselves. So I say, let's get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Let's disrupt the unsettling and let's unravel the hidden hard truths about colonial and unethical methods of collecting and work towards decolonizing, decolonizing museum collections and making them accessible for future generations to come. Yelko and Miigwech. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you for sharing the story about the ancestors. It's, it's emotional, I'm tearing up right now. And um, thank you for sharing and reminding it really, us. It is. Pardon me? Uh, yes. Sorry, it really is emotional, Dal. <laughs> yes, and um, whew, it's shaken me because it's a beautiful, powerful reminder that they are still here with us. They are walking this journey with us on the daily. They are supporting our healing through our connections to our communities. Our, like you said, our ancestors and ourselves as Indigenous peoples. And we can use that, those reminders, those presences, as you said, to disrupt, but to heal and to share. And the truths I think that you have shared with us today, this morning, are, can lead to reconciliation. So thank you very much for sharing those experiences with us. Um, hearing about the beaded works, the gun bag, the pin cushion, and other cultural items in your collection. So fascinating. And I hope I can view these virtually. I'll message you later. <laughs> and thank you for sharing about the work that your team is doing on, on the database um, and that it will be accessible. Miigwech, miigwech, miigwech. Oh, I'm going to take a few deep breaths here because that really, really shook me in a good way. <laughs> I'm going to smudge after. <laughs> I forgot to smudge before I started. I would like to now introduce the second speaker. Laura Peer's work on open dialogues between Indigenous communities and museums across the UK, Europe, and North America. Formerly curator of the Americas Collection, Pitt Rivers Museum, and professor of museum anthropology at the University of Oxford, her research and curatorial practice explores the meanings of heritage ob objects to Indigenous people today and ways that museums can support Indigenous communities. She is now Exhibits Project Manager, Canadian Canoe Museum, and Adjunct Professor, Departments of Anthropology and Canadian Studies at Trent University. Laura, would you please unmute and start your presentation? Thank you very much, Del. And Thank you for Melissa for reminding us why this conference and what we do really matter. Um, sometimes we think we're just sitting at a conference and we're not, this work really matters. It's about healing and it's about coping with the effects of colonial legacies. So thank you for that. Could I have my first slide, please? There we are. Um, so I'm speaking today from near Peterborough in Mississauga territory. I'm a settler and I want to thank uh, the Indigenous participants and organizers of this conference for permitting me to speak at this conference. I recently returned to Canada after 20 years of curating at the Pitt Rivers Museum, where a lot of my work was about initiating dialogue between museum professionals across Britain and Indigenous peoples um, across North America, and doing repatriation and reconnection projects. And I was really fortunate to have as mentors and allies in that process, some wonderful Indigenous teachers, including Juskang Nika Collison, the entire Haida Repatriation Committee, Alan Corbier, who at that time when I worked with him was at the Ojibwe Cultural Foundation and many, many others, um, some of whom are on this, this conference today. So if we could have the next slide, please. It's 
really important for Indigenous people to be able to access heritage collections overseas because these collections are often up to two or three centuries earlier than material available within North American museums. The first explorers, the first settlers, the first fur traders, the first colonial officials, the first uh, naval uh, cartographers, you know, all those early European presences in North America all took or sent items home to Britain and to the continent. Um, this is just one collection in Canterbury Cathedral in the United Kingdom, which arrived there before 1673. Next slide, please. Um, and this is a sash in the British Museum, which is attributed to Lord Amherst. So this is an 18th century sash. Some of these items were, uh, were commissioned. You know, people actually did order things to take back and there's documentation about that. Some of them were purchased. And of course, items were being made for, for trade um, quite early on. Some of them were diplomatic gifts. And so people like Lord Amherst had, as well as wampum, other items um, gifted to them as a diplomatic exchange. And some of them were acquired in completely unethical circumstances. Uh, and the co collections in Britain and the continent reflect the whole range of those paths that people removed items from communities in. Next slide, please. Those items then became dispersed across museums uh, globally, as you all know. Um, and there are some obvious museums you might think to look for across Britain, um, starting with the British Museum, and then the major museums across England, Scotland, and Europe. But there are a lot of not so obvious museums. Some of them are very small and some of them are very strange. So Kew Gardens, the, the botanical center has a, a collection of indigenous material which is organized by plant phylum. So all of the cedar material is all together. Um, all those stately homes in the National Trust. Mm -hmm. Yep, those were colonial officials and they have items. Um, but going down to the Pigorini, the Vatican, the Welt Museum in Vienna, I mean, there's all these tiny, tiny museums, um, and some of them very, very difficult to, uh, to access. And I want to, act, to emphasize while we're looking at this list that there is currently no funding or even formal channels for Indigenous people to access ancestral items overseas. There is no national channel or clearinghouse or, or help for contact. There is no funding to send delegations to work with material. There is no organized method of finding this material. And so in, to a large extent, Indigenous people don't have access to this material. And we need to think of a solution for that or a multiple set of solutions at the national level. Next slide, please. So collections were often brought to England um, by private collect collectors or individuals. They were then donated to local historical or scientific societies and then transferred to regional museums. This is Margaret Bruchak and I in the Saffron Walden Museum near Cambridge a year or so ago, just before COVID. Um, and we were there to, to survey wampum collections for a whole variety of reasons. And when we got into their catalog, they have 18th and very early 19th century wampum. And this is a tiny local museum near Cambridge. Um, but when we got into their catalog, we found that much of it came either from one particular person who had acquired it from, from his friends, from other individuals in a local scientific society, which were sort of all the rage. They were like the rotary clubs of their day. Um, and then it had come to a local museum called the Sudbury Museum, and then it had come to Saffron Walden. As item, and this is a very, very typical path for a historic item overseas. And as these items moved across these various repositories, every time they moved, they lost information. And so they gradually lost the provenance, they've lost their understanding of the nation of origin, they lost the understanding of the context of origin or the meaning. Um, the wampum belts, of course, lost their intended meanings almost straight away. And so it's really hard to locate items. Many of them are now misidentified because of this process, um, or they've lost their identification altogether. And I cannot tell you how many items I have seen in museum collections in Britain and on the continent that say moccasin dot North America or moccasin dot Africa. And I've had to say, no, it's not African. So we have a job ahead of us and we really need to start this work. 
For the visit that's shown here, here where Margaret and I went to look at wampum, I emailed 55 different museums across England, Scotland and Wales. Um, and I'm very happy to work with Indigenous communities to contact those museums now. Um, and I, I'll talk a, a bit about this in, at the end. Could I have the next slide, please? So fortunately, help is at hand in terms of finding uh, items that were dispersed overseas. And the Great Lakes Alliance for the Study of Arts and Cultures is, is um, a wonderful organization that's cross-cultural, and we have worked together for at least 15 years, almost 20 years, to go to museums uh, across Britain and Europe in cross-cultural teams to create records for a wonderful database that we call the, the GKS, the Grass Act Knowledge Sharing System, but I'll just call it the database. And we now have about 700 members. We have about 21,000 records for ancestor objects. Um, and we work with about 60 institutions uh, across several continents. Could I have the next slide, please? So when you, when you get onto the, the database, the Grass Act database, um, you'll see the range of institutions that we include in the database. And Grass Act is only one, of course, of, of a number of digital portals that have sprung up over the past decade or so, including the Research Reciprocal Network at UBC, um, this one in the Northwest Territories. And as Melissa said, many individual nations are, are actually thinking of or starting their own now. Um, and I would encourage them to liaise with us and to work with us to find records that might be um, useful to their communities. So this is just part of the index for the Grass Act database. And it tells you that included in this database are records from the Picorini, records from the Musée d'Histoire Naturelle in La Rochelle, um, the Museum for Volcal Kunda, all over the place. And we have gone to these institutions and worked together to create records. Next slide, please. When you get into a particular institution, it will give you a kind of index of what's in those collections. So there's a thumbnail image and there's a, a very brief description. And who would have thought that the National Museum of Denmark had these amazing ancestral treasures? Next slide, please. And then for every item in the database, um, we have multiple photographs, sometimes very detailed photographs showing damage, looking inside the item if we can, both sides of the item. So far more images than you find on usual museum databases. Um, and we have information about provenance, the history of the piece, what's known about that. Um, and in this case, um, we've had multiple people compiling descriptions and understandings of, of an item to come up with the, uh, the description of this item in the database. Next slide, please. And this is just the index for the Museum Volkerkunde. Um, a lot of 18th century material on the continent, so blackened pouches here. Next slide, please. And in those collections, we are finding uh, photographic materials and sometimes archival materials, and we're also including those in the database. And this particular collection, which um, is at the Museum Volkerkunde, has some incredibly detailed information about the names of peoples depicted in the photographs. So there's, a, there's an absolute wealth of material in here. Next slide, please. Many of you are already GRASAC members, but if you're like me, you forget your password every six months. And so the person to contact is Haley Bryant, and I'll put her email here. Um, but you're also welcome to contact me, and I'll, I'll put you back in touch with her in order to get your password sorted out, or if you want a password. Now, we are in the process with GRASAC um, of, of rethinking the format of the database and certain issues within the database. Um, GRASAC, which was started by Professor Ruth Phillips at Carleton, um, is now managed by Kara Kampodic and Heidi Bohaker at the University of Toronto. And it's been, it's been up and running for long enough that we really feel the need for uh, a rethink um, on everything from design. So we're talking to Indigenous designers, graphic designers, to issues about sacred and sensitive materials um, and how they should be managed within such a resource. 
um, what records should not have photographs of items attached to them, how items should be described, and whether there are issues to do with indigenous data sovereignty on, on the database that need to be addressed. Um, but it is a wonderful resource and we're looking forward to road testing it with indigenous communities and, and artists and makers and all kinds of folks in community um, as COVID conditions permit. Next slide, please. So I also wanted to talk a bit about uh, repatriation um, and the situation regarding repatriation in the UK and the continent right now. This is an amazing moment. Um, you know, when I started at Oxford in 1998, I was told firstly, don't invite those native people here, they'll cause trouble, which was entirely true. Um, and repatriation was simply not something that anybody talked about. And now we have policies, we have had a steady stream of repatriation cases from the UK, particularly over time. The only museums that, um, that cannot repatriate in Britain right now are the ones governed by the British Museum Act, so the national museums. But I would say we've already amended the British Museum Act to take ancestral human remains home. That's been done. And so sometime, maybe not in my lifetime, but hopefully in yours, sometime that act will be changed. And in the meantime, other museums can and are repatriating. And so we're waiting for COVID conditions to allow us to, uh, to finish bringing home Crowfoot's regalia to the Siksika and a wonderful Cree coat, uh, which I think is going to the Cree Cultural Center. The Museum Ethnographers Group has an amazing repatriation resource. This is something that is intended to support museum professionals across the UK in getting on with change. And they encourage you to contrib contribute to this resource. So please have a look at it. It's the Museum Ethnographers Group. They will also act as a clearinghouse to email every museum with non-UK collections to to forward your request. So I'm happy to put you in contact with this, with this group um, to start looking for items from your communities. Um, and, you know, if you've been following the headlines about the Ben and Bronzes, there is, there is just a sea change happening in Europe as well. Things are happening, things are going home, things will go home. And it's our responsibility to keep pushing that process and to make sure that it really happens. Next slide, please. There are also all kinds of wonderful other sorts of projects. Um, and these have proven really useful, not just in themselves, but in building relationships with museum professionals across Britain and Europe, and therefore contributing to change in the culture of museums over there. And I really, I really can't stress that enough. Um, so when COVID hit and we all started our Zoom life, I thought back to a, a Skype link that I had had with Alan Corbier, who's shown here in 2006, when we did a live online video visit with some elders at the Ojibwe Cultural Foundation while Alan was visiting Oxford. And I thought maybe we can revive that technique. Um, so that's what I'm working on now. And what I'm hoping to do is to use a technique that involves Zoom, very simple controls and two cameras so that we can get close up views on ancestor objects in museums. And we can start re-identifying items in the collections. We can start pre-visits. We can decide, we can make informed decisions on who needs to visit things in person. Um, and we can start having more dialogue with those museum professionals doesn't replace in-person visits, doesn't replace repatriation, but it's one more, I think, very powerful tool in our basket for change. I'm working on loan projects right now. I'm working with Hiawatha First Nation and Lori Beavis to bring back as a loan, um, 13 of these quilled mococks that you see at the bottom of the screen here. They were given to the Prince of Wales in 1860 when he visited Rice Lake as part of a, a can Canadian tour. Um, and Hiawatha has decided it is not appropriate to repatriate those because they were gifts, diplomatic gifts given in good faith to the crown. And they do not wish to repudiate that relationship and that's their decision at this time. So we are bringing them back for a loan, but also study sessions um, so that descendants of the makers of these mokaks can all literally touch them and reconnect with them and learn from them. This work, doesn't happen cheaply. Um, one of the reasons I'm leaning towards the online virtual two camera 
technique to do some conversations is it's free. Basically, it's just staff time. The loan for the mokarks, which are held by the Royal Collections Trust, the, the core loan costs are going to be something like $60,000. Um, and actually it would be cheaper to repatriate them. I hate to say that. Um, but Mishisagi people also want to send the Makarks back with interpretive material that they create. And that's a really important component of the project. That's another message they are sending to the crown. Um, and that's really high on their agenda for this project. So there's all kinds of really creative things we can do that will increase um, dialogue that will start to help to further train museum professionals across the continent and the UK, and that will eventually, you know, lead to even bigger changes. Can I have the next slide, please? So I just wanted again to say that we, we need to address the issue of disconnect, uh, this geographic disconnect where items ended up in colonial repositories overseas, and we need to address it at a national level. We need funding for access for visits. We need funding to sort out identification of collections. We need resources for finding ancestral items that are hidden away in tiny museums. And those tiny museums have no expert staff. They often have one or two staff members who are generalists um, and they want to do the right thing. There's a lot of people on the ground out there working in little tiny museums that are the same size as Melissa's museum or um, or Kitigan Zibi or the Ojibwe Cultural Foundation. And they want to be part of the change because they don't know how and they need your help. They need your expertise. So we need some national resourcing. We also need to continue these individual projects that we're all working on. But I would say just go for it. Um, you need to understand that getting into spaces over there can be very, very difficult, far more difficult than it is over here. So we had cases in Oxford, old 19th century table cases with glass vitrines that took six people to take apart. There was no door. You literally had to have a team and the whole thing fell apart. If a researcher shows up at the door and says, I desperately need to see the item in that case, you might not be able to help them. Like you really have to organize this in advance, but it can be done and people do want to do this kind of work with you. Um, Yes, there's a lot of racist terms in the historic records. We need to help people understand uh, the alternatives um, and how to manage those records. And people are hugely grateful for help. Um, they really do want to be part of the change. And I think that's our generation's opportunity as well as our responsibility is to, is to be that change, is to push for that change and to continue making it happen. That's one of my emails. Um, I have others. And if you Google me, you'll, you'll find me online. I'm very, very happy to help you to connect with um, museums overseas. If there's anything I can do to help, please let me know. Miigwech and thank you very much for permitting me to speak. Thank you, Laura, for sharing your experience as a settler and your work with Indigenous materials. It is incredibly unfortunate that resources are not currently available for Indigenous peoples to access these items. And it's a, an important consideration to, um, to action moving forward. So I hope that's something that people will begin to collaborate on and we can start seeing these changes take place, right? Within, within the next year, let's, let's go with the next year. <laughs> I'm also glad to hear about the GRASIC database that brings together 60 international institutions and that you're rethinking the current format of the design of the database and collaborating with Indigenous designers um, to manage the materials in a culturally appropriate manner. I'm truly hoping, I'm not very familiar, I, I work at LAC um, and I know the work that we are doing as an institution. So it's just really wonderful to hear that this is being done. So thank you very much for sharing today. Thank you. On that note, I am, would like now to introduce the final two presenters in the session, McMeekwans and Renee Dillard. McNaught Meekwans is an, Anish an Anishinaabe of Wikwemakon unceded territory in Manitoulin, Ontario, and assistant professor of Indigenous art at the University of Toronto. Currently undertaking research on natural fiber weaving traditions in the Great Lakes, 
Miguns focuses on museum objects as relatives and the placemaking labor of customary art forms. Rene Wassan Dillard, um, Little Traverse Bay of uh, Bands of Odawa, Michigan, is an Anishinaabe elder and master weaver who works closely with the natural fibers of the Great Lakes. Formerly an award-winning black ash basket weaver, the impending destruction of the black ash tree has prompted her to begin a new journey, researching and recovering knowledge of ancestral weaving traditions in cedar, bulrush, basswood, nettle, and more. I invite you both to unmute and begin your presentation. All right, maybe watch. On you, everyone. So, Nick uh, Migwons and Dishnikaz. I'm here representing Wikwemekong and Zeta Territory and the University of Toronto. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here to present on a on a collaborative research project that Renee and I have uh, have been working on over the past several years. Honey, Wasana Dishnikaz. Nimki do dem waganak sing shkwanakoming mumpi um Michigan, United States. All right. Well, uh let's go to the next slide. Just to introduce the project we've been working on uh to research bulrush mats within museum collections. Uh, the research part of this took place over four years from 2015 to 2019. Of course, it's still ongoing. We will get back to it as soon as, <laughs> as soon as circumstances permit. But we went so far to 16 sites, 16 museum collections from Manhattan to De Des Moines, Iowa, halfway across the continent with a team of between one and four indigenous researchers. So us two, and then a couple of assistants as, uh, as we could. We looked at probably more than 400 mats at this point. I really, when, when I started this, I thought it, um, narrowing it to bulrush mats would be really keep the, keep the project nice and contained. Because who, like, who has ever heard of bulrush mats? Turns out literally everyone has them, they're ubiquitous. Everyone has them and no one knows what they are. So we're hoping to correct that. We're especially looking for the names of the makers and we're looking to reconnect with those, with the knowledge they had. But we, uh, we quickly noticed that the mats or any, any of our items with makers attached or with information on them is very rare. We only had five to start with. So our job was to start with those five and try to, try to make more connections with some more. The nations that, we, that the project covered, we visited objects by Ojibwe, Dawa, Potawatomi, Meskwaki, Kekpo, Menominee, and Ho-Chunk, and probably others. All right, that's the scope of the project so far. Next slide, please. Okay, so just as an overview, our method in this project is to remember with our hands. That's something Renee says, said to me one time when we were, uh, when I was, after our first visit together in a museum collection in the, the American Nat Museum of Natural History in New York City. She was trying to teach me how to, how to understand what she'd been talking about that whole day. And she sat down with some of those mats and she's like, all right, write this down. I'm like, I'm ready. I'm ready to, to receive the wisdom of my elder. And she's like, all right, 17, 22, four, six. I'm like, I'm trying to write. She had no idea what she was talking about. So she was trying to teach me. And as she was teaching me, I was doing it. I was weaving it wrong. And she's like, I'm like, what am I doing wrong? And just showing her. And she's had, she just looked at it. She's like, I don't know. So she had to take it and unravel it and then redo it again. She says, I have to remember with my hands before I can tell you. So I'm like, that's our method there, <laughs> how to remember with our hands, because that's what it is. The, the knowledge that we're patriating doesn't happen in our heads or it doesn't happen in our heads first. It happens in, our, in the ways we connect with our hands first. So what this is, is relearning how to listen, observe and receive knowledge from our foremothers through the things they left us. Okay, next slide. And the purpose of all this, of course, is to reforge severed kinships. The material knowledge of our foremothers is the basis of all good relations with land, water, and each other. So we're seeking to repatriate not only the facts of it, of this knowledge, as though there's, as though receiving the, the uh, you know, what kind of bulrush, where the bulrush growed, knowing these things intellectually was enough. We need to repatriate the practice and ethics of its transmission. That's our purpose. So let's look at the project. So next slide, please. All right. So the first thing, of course, is that it's important to bring kin into collections. Um, uh, T. 
teacher and student. So when I, when we started doing this project with Renee, she, it was necessary to become teacher and student first because that is a kinship relation. And that'll change how you relate to all the objects. But also you need to bring some of your family too. So I actually, the, the other two members of my research team that Renee got to know pretty well, my research assistants were brothers and sisters. So you just get them in the car. Get in the car, we're going on a trip. <laughs> <laughs> Worked out pretty well. So there's my sister and myself and Renee in Milak, Milak yep. Museum. Yep. And on the right was another fabulous um, trip. And you can see here the mother daughter team, Cherish Parish and Kelly Church, there with Jennifer Neptune, of course, and in, the, in the collections of the, the Smithsonian in DC. I guess having family there is important. Having family relations there while we're interacting with objects is really important. Even if you can't get your, you can't get your, your mother to come or something. You know, just being, um, having a teacher and student relationship or having that attitude is really important. Because in reality, I know that we have a relationship with the ancestors, although we may not know their names anymore. Mm. But coming to that community and having those um, familiarity with our hands and making those motions, knowing that someone who we may no longer know her name anymore makes those same motions. So that develops that kinship as well as the physical kinship that we continue through the seven generation understanding. That's right. Next slide, please. All right. So the first part, uh, it's important to be able to, for us to browse, explore, and visit with the objects in a social way, of course. So having access to the, the stacks <laughs> is pretty important to be able to go around and do this initial kind of getting to know everyone and getting comfortable with each other. It's a, it, it can be sometimes a little overwhelming, but it's also really good to be able to share that experience with mm -hmm. other weavers. Mm -hmm. And again, it's the teacher and student and the relationship with the items and where those items came from. It goes all the way back to our mother. That's right. All right, next slide. Yeah, so as, as Renee was saying, sometimes it's difficult because when you're, when you're sitting there and trying to focus, sometimes having many active or in need objects right nearby can be difficult. This, uh, this, collect, this site, which will remain unnamed, was especially difficult to work at for a number of reasons. One, you can see how, as you can see that that there is a stack of 80 mats. We did, we were not prepared to, to go in and face the kind of the neediness and plight of the objects and even objects that we hadn't come in intending to connect with. There were so many active things around and what in our workspace, it was really, it was, uh, it was emotionally difficult and it was also just. I had to leave. I had to leave and take a, take a break and prepare it. My spirit wasn't prepared for what was happening in that space and, the, and um, neither was I. So I had to go out and regroup and come back. Yeah. And it, it, it took a little bit more time than what I thought. Well worth it. It was worth it. It was worth it, of course. And I mean, we, have, we, have, uh, we go in prepared for these for this kinds of things, right? I mean, as much as we can. And we have each other, so we're able to work through things and kind of work like a decompress after and talk and say what, what, what was happening there, what was happening in that space and how can we deal with it next? So not only is it important to have kin in the collections just uh, to structure our relationship with the objects, sometimes it's to keep, to hold each other up. You know, you need caring relations with each other because you're gonna need to take care of each other. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need to, you be, you're in a position of kind of saying no to an object. There's an object in need or, or somebody is there who, that has an unfinished story. And it's not, it's just not your, your time. <laughs> you can't help. And it, that, that's like the worst feeling in the world when you're in there specifically, you're like, I'm an indigenous person. I'm going to bring the indigenous knowledge in here. I'm going to help these objects. <coughs> and you, you can't, you can't. <laughs> oh, let's move this. I, or, I know that we left that um, situation much better than when we came in there. Yeah, it's and that, true. that was um, important to respect those, those objects and the, and the women that made them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, yeah, this was, this was tough. There was um, ancestors 
close by. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, <laughs> it was tough. It was tough. Next slide, though. Let's let's talk about the good spaces. So a clear space to think and work is helpful for closer, like sustained study. So once I feel like uh, going in and visiting in, in the collection space in this in this in the stacks is important. I actually found it really helpful when uh, an institution had a separate space, especially if it was well lit and a little bit like private to be able to sit there and have a sustained period of time with these objects. These, these were some good places to, that we worked at. Because we're reconnecting spiritually as well as looking at techniques. And I count threads and we count fibers and we, mm -hmm. we do all of these things, but at the same time, we're introducing ourselves to them and they're introducing themselves to us. And so having this space was super important. Yeah, this was great. So it was in Beloit, there was a great space. Um, I guess there's sometimes there's a danger of it feeling a little bit too clinical, but I really always appreciate when, when places allow us to kind of get ourselves spread. in room a little bit. Yeah, yeah, spread out. Spread out. <laughs> It's what happens. And especially here on the right, I, I appreciated this space because there was multiple surfaces. And so that I, I there was a space where I could work the, and put all my put all my stuff, my research stuff, and then be able to get up and look around at the object. So having multiple surfaces is, is also useful. Next slide, please. All right, here's a key one too. Being able to see items next to each other. And not only the objects that uh, that are in the museum so that we could in the collection so that we can see how they're related to each other. Sometimes it's important to be able to bring our own objects in. Um, and I know that's a whole that's a whole big deal, but it usually it becomes very generative when we can bring our own objects in to see in with that, them being in relation with each other or even raw materials or even materials that you bring in so that you can sit there and try replicating some of those techniques, right? Might take a little planning, might have to go into the freezer for a couple of weeks, but <laughs> it's, sometimes it's worth it. This piece uh, was so, so inspiring. What we're looking at there with Ruth is an uh, old piece that came from Wakemakong, and the piece next to it is a piece I constructed being inspired by this lovely weaver who I, you know, she made this. It was kind of like her going to town bag. It was her, it was really, really nice. Anyway, and um, so I made one to show the inspiration from that one and how, how those traditions are continuing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it helps us be able to see more of those, those objects and see how we're related to them, right? Be able to see, uh... I can see the grandma wearing it going to town, you know, I can <laughs> We love her. All right, next slide. All right, also important, crucial, we kind of know this, but being able to handle, touch, smell, and listen to the object is totally key. And, and again, in the nice quiet space, it might be speaking loudly or it might take a little while. Some of these mm -hmm. pieces can be, I kind of, kind of categorize it like they're kind of comatose. They're kind of still there, but they haven't been. So I have to be very, very mindful of that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes being able to pick up and manipulate the objects in more of a, in a closer way is important. I know it, it, it uh, might hurt, <laughs> physically hurt the conservators to watch, but actually we, you have to trust that we do we do care about these objects that our manner of care is as valid as this kind of conservatorship idea of the object never changing sometimes to show care to something we want to handle it right and remind it of being used and also so that we can get at those those making techniques so what we're trying to find here especially is the where the thread starts and where the thread ends that's what, that's what uh, from the bottom <laughs> where it started where it ended yep Gotta find all of those things bags. And there's different designs on either side. You know, mm -hmm. the bags have different designs. Yep, we need to be able to turn it over <laughs> for sure. All right, next slide. 
So this is a crucial point. In this way, you know, by doing all these things, we can begin to approach objects as teachers too, and thus, and as our kin, right? Be able to see that person standing behind that object. This is such an emotional piece yeah. for me. This is, uh, we know the, the maker mm -hmm. has a name connected to her hands. And I feel like I really, really know her. I know what numbers that she likes to use. I know her salvage edge. And she even showed me how to keep my weft taunt. And all I had to do was just listen to her and pay attention to her. So half made pieces. This is my elder teacher. And I treat her that way. I love her. So um, the maker that was creating this, it's just um, incredible to be sitting in the space that she was as she was weaving. It's mm -hmm. just so. Uh, yeah. It's cool to be able to see it hung up there as though you're sitting in front of it weaving and you could be like, oh no, this is how you would move as, to, uh, to work on it, move across it. After this piece, I went home and created a whole nother map, mm. whole different designs, whole nother techniques. She taught me a lot. It's really, really remarkable. Yeah. So on the next slide, I think we'll be able to see the, oh, no, there's another one first. So just to find uh, a key point here is the, that um, I guess has to do with the intersections of this kind of like disciplinary formations and how they was get in the way of actually re reconnecting sometimes, especially if, if the um, museum people kind of insist on the primacy of those like, or their own authority. So cultural areas and judgments of quality really do obstruct this process of connection. So having, having the curators or conservators assume, of course you would only want to see the Ojibwe stuff. Of course you only want to see the Adawa stuff those categorizations are so inaccurate and not really based on, on very much information. So why would you only show us that, those things or, or assume that we only wanna see the masterpieces or we only wanna see a certain kind of item? We won't, so first of all, just to trust what, that what we're asking you to bring us so that we can reconnect because sometimes these pieces, sometimes the so-called ugliest pieces you have those are the ones that are that we're going to find connection through right so, so this is a such a significant piece what i learned on it. here when the maker um, created that salvage edge i now know her pattern i now know her mm -hmm. and i can see her work um and her techniques this is her last known piece mm -hmm. And um, it was uh, it was really remarkable because now her hands are reconnected to a lot of the dance, and her name can be reconnected there. So it's just so so beautifully significant. Yeah. So when I look at that, I'm looking at something, um, and I see something maybe that might be overlooked. I guess is our point. Mm -hmm. So this is actually one of the one of the very few pieces that had a make a known maker, and we have not only known we not only know the name, but there are photos of her making this piece. And this is the last known. This is the last mat she made. She was uh, very advanced in age at the time, and she was blind oh. and arthritic, and she made this as a demonstration piece not only for the anthropologist who came asking about her techniques, but for her daughter who, who was there to witness. And she's like, this is a teaching piece. So next slide, we can start to see how these relations can come back out. So here we have the, the teaching object as we're calling it. And it leads us to this teacher, Saka Tenokwe, or Mrs. Bill Leaf of the Meskwaki Nation. And uh, not only that, but that, le that leads us to her student, to the learner Mary Neal, and uh, after after this anthropologist went and documented the teacher making this this mat this master this master weaver making her final mat, um, she she said, "Oh, go ask my student. She she has all my knowledge. She can weave you a mat." So the anthropologist then went to Oklahoma and found 
this student and she commissioned from her this beautiful panther mat and documented all of these processes of making. So we actually have, we have this whole lineage, this, we have a teacher, we have a kinship in collections moment and we can actually start to connect to these pieces. <laughs> And those, uh, it, it's just after going into so many collections and looking at, and Mick finding all of the, you know, written knowledge and all of the records leaning to that, I was, and I still am astonished at how little there was. It really was, it was a little like, stepping stones just trying to find all this, <laughs> the connections but they're sometimes they're there and they just you just need to be listening well enough to be able to receive that knowledge so on the next slide you can start to see how these knowledge connections can be brought back so again from this from this one teaching object that brings us uh to this teacher we we have a selvage all that object needs to bring us is that selvage not only those kinship connections to the learners but to a salvage that will help us identify this maker with all of these masterwork panther mats in, that we've been seeing across all these collections. So all these mats that didn't have a name before, now we have a way to match because these makers each had their own kind of, they encoded their, uh, their almost their signature or their, but they're in this particular Their numbers. Way. Yeah, their numbers. Yep. Their numbers, their, their technique. Mm -hmm. These all, you, you you wouldn't know it, I guess, unless you were a maker. But the 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 salvage edges, how how something is started and how it's finished, will tell you a lot about how it's constructed, mm -hmm. and and who and who did it. So yeah, this also tells I mean, us a lot about the primacy of maker knowledge. Eh? In these lines of descent in knowledge transmission and in the in uh, authority over an object, it's it's maker knowledge that's going to it's going to allow you to make those connections. So again, so we have this teaching object, and that leads us to a teacher, and that allows us to become learners as well. Because once we have a teacher and a teaching object, we are able to take that on and bring to the next step, which is uh, which is making them right, reasserting these practices. So that's the next slide, right? Oh yeah, next slide. Well, first we have to tell, say that these knowledge transmission connections, they have to start on the land. So we can't just go in cold to the museum, expect to be able to extract information like we're going in and mining knowledge. We have to have, have we have to have, uh, these relations have to exceed the museum. So we have to start making good relationships before we go into the museum. We have to start on the land. We have to go ask those rushes and learn how to be in good relation with those rushes before we'll be able to connect with a rush mat in a museum. So that's first. So in this um, picture on the one side is the community learning to harvest following blindly. There's no other weavers. At that time, there were no other weavers here. And um, so they came out with me and continue to come out and harvest bulrushes, which you can see drying in the process. But what this helped me do is help these young people and um, people healing from historical trauma. And I've reintroduced them to the earth mm -hmm. and how to start this process and then weave it together, so to speak, you know, to show how these um, values are still useful in our culture and in our everyday practices. But it does start from the land. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. And here's after the museum. So before and after the museum, these knowledge transmission connections must lead back to community. So we must be bringing it back. We're bringing something back and we're bringing the connections back. And so we have to go back. So this is us, this is us at uh, the Meskwaki Cultural Center. This was a, such um, a satisfying, a satisfying part. They're, we have so many generations there standing over our elder, which is the mat. And um, this young man is a keeper of a sacred item that he's looking for his community to create, 
to retire this one that was made by the weaver that we saw in the earlier slide. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to learn from that weaver, bring it back home to practice. And then this Meskwaki community, I was able to gift it back to them to complete that cycle where those sacred items will continue to be used and they can repatriate the, the other one. So put it back where, where it belongs and to retire it. So these items are still being um, utilized, of course, and um, that learning process and to be part of that completion of bringing it back, bringing it back home was an honor. Next slide. So that was us going to Meskwaki to kind of look at their uh, material and initiate some of those connections. And then following that, they were able to organize a trip to Wasson's studio in Michigan, where they made some new teaching objects. So all these, this is all leading up to the creation of new, these are, if these ever enter a collection and someone's like, those don't look like masterworks, they're teaching objects. And yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Everyone starts somewhere, right? Yeah. yeah. So, and they're about and then, initiating those connections. Some new, uh, new techniques might come in to uh, go on here as in the, in the last slide, but the other pieces are getting their hands reacquainted with the bulrushes mm -hmm. and figuring out how, how, to, how to move their hands. So yeah, they're, they're absolutely, it was absolutely a a whole beautiful process. Yeah, next slide. Yep. And that'll lead, of course, to the creation of new artworks, renewed relations with each other and with land. I think the first slide is probably the most emotional because I was able to give the descendants of this community the pattern that belonged to them. Mm. I, I know it belonged to them because I saw her weaving it and then I got to hold the piece, see the piece. So there's like, there's no question this belongs to you. And it was very emotional for, for them to bring it home and, and, uh, and to continue this work. And now when they go and look in a collection, their uh, hands will be able to mm. identify what's going on as well as their hearts. Yeah, I find that really important too for this this uh, getting beyond this kind of like visual access that we're we're taught to rely on so much in the Western tradition. So it's not our eyes and it's not our, our heads that are going to understand first. Or if you think if you think you understand that way, you're not. It's not. That's not really the case. It's our it's our hands that are going to remember because we're, they're going to remember the exact the way the pattern that that foremother's hands took in tracing across that object in order to make it. That in retracing those trips, those trails, that's what's going to allow us to reconnect with that with that foremother. Right, hold hands with her again. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So, um, I believe the next slide is our last. <laughs> we just just want to say miigwech, and uh, uh, the work is ongoing. <laughs> <laughs> it is ongoing. It's been a challenging year for for many of us the studio is closed and it, and um i'm i'm not sure if it's going to open this year or maybe later we'll see it's all up to the creator and yep. let's see what happens in the world the time will come again but uh miigwech for listening and uh we hope that you could have some uh, you had some takeaways there, some ideas for making connections yourself. Okay, thank you much. No, miigwech. Miigwech, Mick and Renee. What an honor to learn about the woven works of our peoples. This is all so emotional for me. I hadn't realized how impactful this was um, from a personal experience, just thinking back um, to those university days and me having to hand write my notes in order for the information to stick in my head, right? So the hand woven, woven works really speaks to me at a powerfully different level and how I still have to hand write 
in order to retain, to be able to remember what I was taught, as opposed to just sitting there in a classroom looking at a teacher who is dictating lessons to me, right? It's that hand, the hearing and listening that we do with our hands. Thank you very much for sharing that. And the natural fibers, uh, knowing that natural fibers that our people use in their works are still alive, still spiritual, still teaching us, right? And the only way we know is when we hold them. And we have to make sure that we hold them in a very sacred way, right? And that we handle them respectfully. And when we are in those stacks, in museums and in colonial institutions, and those materials are there, our, the bones of our ancestors are there. So many people I've heard, indigenous peoples have said that they've heard those materials, those objects, those bones speak to them, shake them, that they've had to leave because we, are, we do not have the authority to care for them the way that they're meant to be cared for. Thank you very much for your teachings today, for sharing those beautiful images. It, um, I cannot express to you how powerfully it has impacted me. Miigwech. So I'm just gonna take a few breaths, maybe if other people too, I'm going to mute myself for a second. So we have, I see that in the Q&A, there are currently eight questions and I will proceed to read them and we'll give some time for the answer. So from Adri Adrian Dewsbury, I know Graska stands for Great Lakes, but have you worked with communities out West? Thanks, Del. Uh, the answer is uh, yes, I have worked extensively with Blackfoot people, but uh, Grass Act doesn't uh, extend beyond the Great Lakes watershed. So if you were looking for a database, that, like a portal that covered items from that region, from like Treaty 7 or Alberta region, you would be probably looking for the Research Reciprocal Network at UBC. But I think we're, we're probably going to look at, we will probably watch fairly soon the development of multiple portals um, to, to make sure that all of these areas and communities are, have, have specific access. Yeah. Thank you very much. There is a question from Eric Huckleberry. Is the Grass Act database online accessible to the general public? Yes, it is. You have to apply for and, and receive a password. We're, we're hoping to be able to remove the password and make it a completely public database sometime within the next year or so. And we're just um, working with Indigenous advisors to consider the implications of that change. Um, so if you contact Haley or myself uh, or the Grass Act site, we can start you the process of, of getting a, a, a password and getting online. Thank you, Laura. From Mini Kunishish, we are in the process of requesting for funds for a repatriation project. Once we get started, I will definitely definitely give contact information to the Cree researcher. I think that's a comment. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, if anyone wants to respond to it, I'll go for it. <laughs> the more repatriation, the better from over there. Happy to help if I can. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is from an, an, an attendee. Where the where were the institutions that held the mats treating them as living objects? Did you recommend improvements to their methods of storing them? Uh, Renee is telling me to go ahead and answer that. Uh, no, the, I mean institutions don't. No, they can't treat objects as living or they can't treat the mats as living objects. I think it's it's not for them to be able. They can't do that. So, um, but we did, we, we did recommend improvements to their methods of storing them. Sorry, my, my cat is being needy. Um, especially for bulrush mats, and especially, especially for cedar mats, we ask them always to store them flat, right? Instead of having them rolled up. The bulrush mats are very resilient to rolling, but the cedar mats cannot be stored rolled for any length of time. 
We also reminded them that they are, uh, well, they're, they're alive when they're full of water because they're water, thing, they're water objects and they are, uh, the way that they are, they are so helpful to us is that they mediate this, the kind of moisture in the ground between us and the ground. They mediate their insulators, they're actual insulators, but they're, uh, it's their being full of water that is, uh, makes them alive and makes them able to work with us. Um, but maybe so what I usually what I usually try and help them, if you don't mind, Mike. Uh, yeah. I, I try and tell them they need a drink. I know that doesn't go along with best practices with how you store things, um, but they need a drink from time to time in order to give them more life. It, it, because the drier they get, the more crumbly they're they're going to fall apart. These are natural fibers, and they're they're kind of supposed to. So their life expectancy would actually be longer if they were rehydrated on a semi-annual basis or something like that. And the storage was, you know, they were, they're just storing them like rugs, you know, rolled up. And natural fibers aren't, it's not like wool, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it has an expiration date that way. Hope that answers that. Yep. Thank you for taking the time to respond to the question. Another question from Sarah Morphy. How would you recommend hydrating the mats? Put them in like a higher, like what did they do when we went to the NMAI? Would they recommend there's like a room like that they bring things gradually up to, to a more hydrated level? Not by, they don't dunk it. They put it in a high, in a room that is like more humid than others and they gradually bring it up. So that was, that was nice. Because yeah. in reality, it's in such an air controlled environment, you control the humidity in there. It doesn't get what it needs as if it were outside and being used. So the life expectancy of the mat would actually be longer being used. Yeah. In some cases. So. If it was, a, if, I had, if I had a mat that was just in my house and I wanted to take it out for a ceremony, I would, I would definitely go put it on the dew in the morning, you know, put it on the ground, the wet ground in the morning. And that's how you rehydrate it. Ooh. Thank you very much for answering that. Um, Sarah Murphy says, Murphy says, thank you. Kara Quim. Oh, I cannot pronounce the last name, Krimpot, um, asks or states, I've been really curious how well Brian Deere works for cultural belongings as opposed to books, documents. Melissa, can you say more about its strengths and struggles? That's such a great question, Kara. Um, in my experience, I've so far only used it in regards to books and documents, but you do bring up an important question. I'm sure that some of the subject headings um, within the system can most definitely be applied when looking at objects and accessioning them that way rather than you know, the standard museum year, lot number, et cetera, um, then that'd be a really interesting approach. I'm not sure, depending on the extent of objects that they have, I'm not sure all the subject headings could apply. So it'd be interesting to, uh, I may have to look into trying to adapt that when I can get a chance to assess their three-dimensional objects uh, after COVID. Thank you very much. Another question from Jeanette. I'm a I am a transplanted West Coast New Ch Oh gosh, sorry, I will. I don't know how to say it. <laughs> New Chanun, a contemporary cedar bark weaver, plus outstanding to learning nations and Ontario harvest and weave with cedar. Uh, to have a conversation about when is best time to harvest cedar bark in Ontario. We got your email. <laughs> 
you will be in contact. Thank you very much. Okay, so was she asking for the best time to to harvest cedar bark? Well, why don't you go ahead and and, and share there? Share with everyone. She just she asked just for herself, but we can share. <laughs> oh, I get it. Okay. Um, it stops by the time the rice is ripe and it will start by the time the strawberries come out, but they're not red. So it's really hard to follow a 12 month calendar in a 13 month year because our calendar is 13 months. <laughs> so you have to go by um, the plants and the season because we're also in climate change, so everything's changing. But it, it usually stops about the time a wild rice is ripe. I like that question. Another question, anything surface on natural dye ideas? Oh, that's a really good one. Uh, that's you. I, I, it's a huge, I, um, I believe the mats that we're looking at, the majority of them, a very, very small portion was um, natural dye. The majority of them were commercial dye. I do know how to use natural dye, but in, in, dyeing, in dyeing natural fibers, it's just a, a whole process in all itself. You should understand that natural dyes for each color is a minimum of three days of you know, processing and work. And so if grandma had a chance to get it in a powder or to get it, and some of the annuity payments were also dye. They, they were making dyes for, because it was so popular, but our dyes were actually better. But um, yeah, if they had a chance of getting powder dye or going out and starting this process and every hue is different, because all the plants are different. So yeah, it was a, a huge process. Thank you very much. Another question is, is there, are there job openings in Europe for indigenous museum professionals and educators exchange or paid internships? Yes, there are. Um, they're coming up all the time. They're coming up more frequently. Manchester just hired an indigenous curator. Um, we're starting to circulate those kinds of advertisements on the GRASAC uh, email list. That might be one place to look, but yes, they're absolutely out there and they're increasing. Thank you very much for taking the time to answer the questions that were posed by the participants today. Well, I wanted to thank each of our speakers and presenters today for coming to the virtual session and sharing your knowledge and your experiences with us very important teachings, I think, for myself anyway, all the way around. And some tremendous reminders as well about the items that are held in institutions here on our own territories and internationally and the relationships, you know, that those, um, I guess, were given to people <laughs> is something very important for us as I think in terms of the ongoing relationships that we Indigenous peoples have always strived to nurture, right? And wanting to be active in the way that our materials are handled. I am grateful for the Indigenous peoples who are in these fields doing this work and for the settlers who are allies and doing the work in a respectful way and reaching out to Indigenous uh, colleagues and collaborators. So thank you very much for, for the work that you are all doing and for sharing what you have shared with us today. <laughs>